What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bar, Quest Nutrition, Einstein Bagels, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, coaches, you know, anyone working with clients one-on-one, stop just trading time for dollars shift from working one-on-one to one-to-many, you can go to rise25.com, learn more, download the free dream product ladder, which is is basically a business plan on one sheet of paper that helps you see gaps in untapped revenue in your business. Companies like Disney, Apple, Sporting Industries, they all use versions of the product ladder. Check out Rise25. Today, I am very excited. We have Sarah Sarah Chalos, co-founder of iHeart Quinoa with Ravi Jolly. Hey, Sarah. I'm excited because I Heart Quinoa is, I'm very into health, and anyone who is should check out this company. I Heart Quinoa makes superfoods accessible to consumers with a range of tasty food products, including quinoa based snacks, such as, you know, I made the mistake, Sarah, of going on your website because it just made me hungry. There's <laughs> Himalayan pink salt chocolate quinoa puffs, That's peanut nice. butter chocolate quinoa puffs and many, many more. We'll talk about the range of products you guys have, and I know I want you to show show us some of them. They can be found in thousands of stores across the U.S. and globally in places like Whole Foods, CVS, 7-Eleven, and of course on Amazon and their own website. Uh, before I Heart Quinoa, Sarah studied engineering at MIT, worked in R&D and manufacturing at Abbott Laboratories, earned her MBA at Chicago Booth, consulted for big corporate clients at Bain & Company, uh, the most impressive part is that Sarah does all this while raising two kids. Sarah, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I want to start with that part because that, I mean, all of that, you've just this amazing background. And then if anyone has kids, you know how hard that part alone is, let yeah. alone running a busy, successful company. So what's the toughest part about being a mom and in running a business? Um, I mean, I think it's it's just a lot of hours in the day, so you get really tired, that's the, that's the hardest part. But I would say that I, I kind of see it the other way, that um, running your own business is actually really enables being a mom because you're so much more flexible than if you're working in an office or a you know, regular corporate job. You know, if, if somebody's sick, I can leave without feeling really guilty. Uh, if I need to make a piano recital, I can make it. Um, and I just work at different times, right? I can work on the weekend or I can work at night. And what I do is really flexible from where I'm doing it. So I, I feel like it's actually sort of a benefit and sort of enables being like a, a working mom. Yeah. And I'm sure a big part of your life is, you know, being an entrepreneur and running the business. How do you instill or teach or talk about that with your kids? I'm not sure how old they are. Yeah. So one is uh, four and one is six. Okay. Um, yeah, they see the product around all the time, um, and they know that mommy sells quinoa. And uh, one of them says, "I'm sure he might be just saying it to be nice to me, but he says he wants to sell quinoa when he grows up." Which They're like, don't wait, fun. child labor, <laughs> start right now. It happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> They're also very cute, so I bring them to the store with me uh, when I need to sell because that helps. Actually, my first um, sell-ins. My oldest was a baby, so I had him at like some of the, I was selling while I was on maternity leave, and so I had him with me. I was like, I can do it. I brought him to some meetings. and. Where did um, you go? Like was, into the grocery store when you're getting it in? Yeah, exactly. Because he was really little, so I didn't have a nanny or anything yet. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he was sleeping or he was in the car seat. Um, there was one meeting where I like I had to take him out of the stroller because there were only stairs, so I was just holding him. It was a little a little awkward, but you know, you gotta make it work. You do whatever you need to do. <laughs> What's the reaction for that? It's probably 
I mean, I would think someone should, if they're listening to this and they have their own food company, they should rent a baby for the day. If they don't have one, bring it to the meeting as long as it doesn't cry all the, the whole right, time. Right, exactly. I would say it was a net positive. It, um, yeah. Yeah, that meeting in particular, he just kind of like, the buyer just kind of ignored it. He didn't really, I think he was, um, didn't know how to react. <laughs> so he just like pretended like it wasn't there. Um, but for the most part, I think people, you know, think they're pretty cute. and uh, They've been helpful. You know, they help me sticker things if I need to or color in things when we make mistakes and we need you know, coloring work. So they're helpful. Yeah. And I want to talk, I want to talk about the early on days, you know, people see it now it's on shelves all across the country, even internationally, but it took a lot of effort and and work to get it there. Um, So I want to talk about that, but, but first I want to talk about some of the learnings. You've said just this amazing breadth of experience before starting Ironheart Key One. I want to know like from Bain and Company or Abbott or your MBA, what are some of the learnings that you took to start and, and launch the company? Yeah, I think um, having the background I have has been super helpful actually because um, it was just a really good training ground I, working at big companies. You know, at the, ultimately that's not where I felt most comfortable, um, but I think I, I learned a lot at those places. So at Abbott, I learned a lot about, you know, just project management and staying on top of things. And I learned a lot about logistics, which um, there's a lot of logistics that go into, you know, securing your raw materials and scheduling the trucks to pick everything up. And so um, logistics and warehousing was something I really learned a lot about there. What's the uh, toughest part about logistics? That um, I would say it's just just manpower. Just got to kind of ground it out. You have to schedule the trucks, and the trucks are always late, and it just just takes patience and and hours in the day. Um, <laughs> so you need to be pretty organized. Um, but it's not like you know mentally challenging. I yeah. just mean like you know, do you find that because you guys source uh, the quinoa from Bolivia? Um, yeah. Is it the logistics like receiving it? more challenging or is it more kind of pushing out the door like getting it getting it made packaging and getting it out yeah um you know there were some when you're small i I would say the sourcing part is really challenging because you're trying to buy small amounts and and make it work from a cost standpoint you know not put yourself out of business once you get a little bit of scale i think that part it just becomes easier because more people want to work with you they want to sell you you know full truckloads instead of a case um It's just easier to, to, to manage that. And then on the other side, you know, I, w- I would say it's just in terms of timing, making sure you have inventory of everything. And we don't manufacture anything ourselves because we don't have the capital to build our own facility, right? Yeah. So we have several different manufacturing facilities. So coordinating all of that and making sure you're never out of stock of 17 different SKUs uh, when you're a really small company is, is challenging. What made know. you decide to go and get your MBA? I'm always um, curious. Yeah, so I didn't have a, a very strong business background at all. I, you know, I studied engineering. I, st- I did a lot of science. Um, so, you know, when I worked at Abbott, I felt like I didn't really understand sort of the underpinnings of the of the business. Um, and after working there for six or seven years, I also felt a little a little bored. I just kind of wanted to shake things up. I feel like you have to work for a long time, right? You got you got 30, 40 years of working career, right? Uh, to look forward to. So why not kind of take a little break and take some time to reinvent yourself and do something different. So sort of both Did you of those. know that you'd want to start something entrepreneurial going into the MBA or, or that wasn't even in your, your line of sight? Yeah, no, I always, I always liked entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, I worked for small companies even in college. Um, I worked for a small medical device company in college um, that was for sure my favorite working experience. Mm. Um, just like that energy that you get in a small company and sort of that, the passion that people bring feels different than working in a big company. And so I just hadn't, you know, I looked for a small company, a small medical device company after college and didn't find one that was a good fit Um, because also you have to find the personalities are so important, right, when it's a small company. So I didn't find one that was a good fit. Very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few. I remember talking to a few crazy CEOs. Um, (laughs) So, uh, so you know, it just didn't work out. And then I felt like a business school, that was something that, you know, there was an opportunity to kind of get involved in that again. And you just have a lot more resources and a lot of chances to try things out. And so I took a lot of entrepreneurship classes there. And that's where I met Ravi. Yeah. So this started almost incubated in when you met Ravi in your MBA program. What was the initial idea at the time? I mean, maybe the same, maybe it's different from now. I don't know. Yeah, the idea was basically to make quinoa. So Ravi had just come back from Bolivia uh, first from spring break, and he had seen quinoa being used there in lots of different ways. And here we weren't using it um, anyway besides this just using it. This was what year about? Uh, 2009. Okay. 
Yeah, because as reference, like quinoa has become more popular, right? But in 2009, I mean, were people even talking about quinoa? That wasn't even no. in. No, the, like, people. So we were. We stood outside of Whole Foods as part of uh, this, this the incubating the idea, and we said, just ask people coming out of Whole Foods, do you know what quinoa is? And we only got about 20 percent of people saying, yeah, I know what it is. I don't, you know, on Whole Foods. Yeah. So that's you know that says a lot about how far quinoa has come. I think For we sure. got. Pretty lucky that it became like the poster child for healthy eating. Thank you, Oprah. Thank you, Dr. Oz. <laughs> Luck or foresight, well, whatever it is, right? Yeah. So he came back from Bolivia, and what did he see? So he had seen in the markets there a lot of um, snacks and cereals and just um, other ways of you know of using quinoa, not just as a, a side dish or like a rice substitute. Mm -hmm. so he said we don't you know there's a, a, a gap in the marketplace here. We don't use quinoa like that here, so there's a, there's an opportunity. And so we were in a, a group and he we all pitched our ideas and that was the idea he pitched and we we liked his idea the best. Mm. So, but you know people in that group probably split off. Right, and yeah. then you guys kept going with it. So, what happened after uh, the? I guess was it a class project? It was, yeah, yeah. yeah it was. Um, it's called uh, strategies of entrepreneur, new venture strategy, is what yeah. it's called. So, then um, what yeah, happened so after, after that? We just, um, you know, it was two thousand nine, so the economy was really weak, and um, a lot of us got our start dates pushed back at our post business school job. So um, had a little time to kind of workshop the idea and see if it could get some traction. So over that summer and then the fall, um, after we graduated, um, we started just making samples and going to farmers markets and we incorporated the business and just started kind of getting our toes wet. Yeah. And then we kind of kept that up while we were working, which I think was a really, you know, safe way to try something out, you know, yeah. you quit our jobs and go start selling quinoa like crazy people. I want to break both of those down because I think this often gets skipped over. You know, people see it on the shelves and they don't realize kind of what it took to get there because you talk about making samples in farmer's markets, right? Both of them take some grit and effort and you guys are working corporate jobs, right? You don't right. need to be at a farmer's market um, selling face-to-face. Right. -face. Right, the reality is, but you had a passion for this. So, talk about first of all the making the samples piece. What was, you know, the original? What did that original product look like? Probably different from what we see now. Yeah, for sure. We started with the clusters because that is, you know, you can buy all of those ingredients at, at Whole Foods, um, and we bought a lot of ingredients and, um, you know, agave syrup and you know a lot of things that are not in the product today. And we just um, experimented with different recipes, and then to get the shape. Um, we had many, we tried different things. We tried ice cube trays because our original So you product, would mash it up like the quinoa, put like agave syrup or whatever mixtures and then push them into like ice yeah. cube trays. Yeah, gloves on, push them in the ice cube trays, try to get them out. We used uh, mini muffin tins. <laughs> and our first farmer's market, um, I flew to New York and I brought all my, I spent the whole night in the kitchen. Robbie spent the whole night in his kitchen, and we combined all of our samples that we had made at home, which maybe is not okay, but we were very clean. That's uh, farmer's <laughs> market for you. I mean, that's what you, that's what you get there. So right, exactly. So yeah, I mean, and that's that's it's fun to workshop the ideas like that, and it's a very safe way to do it to get. And when people try it in front of you, you get really immediate feedback because I think yeah. when you give it to your friends and family, of course they're gonna be like, "That's great." Nobody wants to you know tell you the truth, but a stranger's. You can tell by their face. Yeah, what well, if, especially if they paid money, right? If right. they paid money, right. they want their money's worth and they want it to be good. Um, right. What was that initial? Tell me about the initial farmer's market. What was the reaction? What were you seeing? What was like good and what was not good? Um, because you obviously, you know, changed accordingly. Yes, we got feedback there on uh, the flavors. We got feedback on the texture. Um, we also saw other small companies. I remember um, like a kimchi company there and saw other people doing what we're doing. So I think that gave us, um, you know, kind Some of get that energy, yeah. validation and energy to, to, you know, hey, if other people can make this work, maybe we can do it do it too. And, and having people buy it and, and say, yeah, oh, I've never seen anything like this. Oh, what a great idea. That gives you, you know, the confidence to move forward too. And I think ultimately that's what helped us say we were willing to start investing the money in you know real packaging and formulation were those initial um, trials and farmers markets and stuff yeah so based off of the feedback and everything you're getting what was the first uh, flavor first product that you came out with because you yeah. had to find a co-packer to go right 
And that journey, right. and we went how was that journey? Was that, was first, that hard? we took our recipe and said, okay, we want to scale this up. So how would you adjust it or scale it or kind of change the ingredients to make it a little more manufacturable? Yeah. So we worked with a, um, a, f- a food formulator in the suburbs of Chicago. Mm-hmm. And that was our first investment in terms of, okay, we're going to try to make this really work. Yeah. Uh, and, and then... then- Co-packers, we just looked online. It's that was the hardest part, I think, to find somebody who would do really small batches, right? Because you know we only wanted forty pounds; we didn't want forty thousand pounds. Yeah, yeah, and it's you are bootstrapping it, so you can't just right. plump down this, especially if you want to change the product or, or iterate from there. Um, right. So, what was the first uh, product that you the flavor you came out with? Um, the almond cranberry cashews. Okay. So we launched with four flavors, one of which uh, is no longer in existence. The uh, so we launched with a, an almond um, quinoa cluster, chocolate sea salt, which is basically the almond but with chocolate drizzle Sounds on top. Sounds great. Yeah. Everybody loves chocolate. Keep talking. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, cranberry cashew and um, ginger peanut was our fourth flavor. So and that, which one peanut, didn't make it? Yeah, ginger peanut. Yeah. That was my. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that. <laughs> idea. I really love ginger, but you know, that's one of the, another thing. I think uh, we learned along the way is uh, we need to look at the data, right? So ginger is not a top-selling flavor, and uh, you know, now we know, and we did it the hard way. We learned that one the hard way. <laughs> so looking back, would you have released the same amount, less flavors, more flavors? What would you have done differently, if anything? I think four was a good number four. because a lot of stores would just say, oh, yeah, I'll take a case of each, right? So if you only launch two, you only get two slots, slots on the shelf. Um, but uh, I, we might have, you know, going back and thinking about it, I probably would have workshopped the ginger a little bit more to say, okay, is that the right flavor? Because ultimately we were we ended up replacing that with a peanut butter cacao. Um, but that's still, it's hard to make that swap once you have, you know, you only get to meet with the buyers once a year and you're sort of, in a rut and so if you didn't put your best foot forward um you know the first time around it's hard to, to yeah. change that yeah so you have your first batch now how do you sell it or did you already pre-sell it at that point so our first batch um we had kind of taken the the samples to whole foods um actually our first <laughs> i don't know how we got a meeting we were just, you know you don't know what you don't know so we wrote That's to whole the foods best yeah, yeah we, we have this great product. It's called the Quinoa Cluster. Would you meet with us? And when we went to the meeting, we had our products in Tupperware, and they were like, so you don't have packaging? <laughs> like we're selling it in Tupperware in Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they were actually very supportive, um, surprisingly, and you know said, okay, maybe you know this sounds like a great project. Uh, why don't you come back when you have packaging? So, um, so we did that. That kind of said, okay. Oh, yeah, there's probably going to be a market for this. So we did a, the smallest run of packaging we could and then made the, you know, a small batch of, of product to put in it so that when we went to the stores, we had um, some initial product. And then I was just going store to store in Chicago and Robbie was going to store to store in New York, you know, and I, I was carrying my baby and um, saying, hey, here's here's a sample. Would you like to try it? And uh, I'll FedEx it to you if you want to if you want to order it. So we were selling direct to stores at the beginning. You would go door and ask to talk to the, the staff at the stores and yep. get them to try it. Now, would you schedule that at a time or would you just walk in and be like, my baby's crying. I need you to just try this. I need, <laughs> your, I need your attention. Right. Uh, no, I mean, now that I know more about the grocery industry, I know that they prefer that you make an appointment, but at the time you I didn't show know. Up. That's, that's show great. Up. Yeah. yeah. Why you're you're there in person. Yeah. They can't just shoo you away, but they can't right. shoo you away on a phone call. So, right. so then ultimately, at what point did you get in Whole Foods? So Whole Foods is actually um, a, a tough tough nut to crack. So that one, um, it's hard to get authorization, and it's very decentralized. So um, we sold into a lot of stores in Chicago and New York before we got into Whole Foods, actually. What was so the big... You felt a big break along the journey of getting into a retailer. Um, Wegmans was our our first big break. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's you know a retailer in the Northeast that everybody is is super passionate about. And when they took our quinoa clusters into all their stores, uh, and we had some help there with a, a distributor. By that time, we were selling to a distributor, and so they had presented our product. Um, and once we got that approval, that's when I quit my job. I was like, okay, this is happening. I really want to do this full time because, you know, Wegmans wants us. This is this is the real deal now. And that gave me the, the confidence to kind of jump ship and, and go all in. Never look back. That's t- It's a tough decision, though, even with that, right? Yeah, I mean, looking back now, I feel like that was probably a little 
crazy and premature, but you know, at the time it felt like a, a, a big leap, a big, you know, jump for yeah. our company. And, and I wanted to see what we could do with it. For someone Sarah, who's in the same search, you know, situation now, let's say they're doing something on the side and they're wondering, when do I transition? Um, what were you thinking about at the time? And I guess, what would you tell someone who's kind of walking the, walking the fine line? Um, I would say you got to follow your gut. You know, if you, if you honestly believe in your heart of hearts, uh, that you have enough evidence, um, then it's, then it's the right time. You know, if you're still not sure, um, it's probably not the right time because once you're in, you have to give it, you know, 150% all the time. And if you're doubting yourself once you're in, I think that, you know, that, that would make it really scary. Yeah. So I think, I think you have, you know, you, only, only, you know, when it feels right and it might never feel right because I think some people just don't, um, they don't like to feel that un, you it's know, uncomfortable. Right, it's super uncomfortable, and and if you're not comfortable with that, then it's not the right choice for you at all. Yeah. And I think a lot. I mean, of people- it's tough, Sarah. I mean, because you have a really good job, you have health insurance. I mean, those factors that when you go on your own, you no longer have health insurance. Some no, you know, there's no vacation pay anymore, right? right? right. So it's a tough, tough. There decision. might not be any pay at all, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I mean, I was also fortunate. Like my husband has, um, he's the he's the more sane one, so I I do so. <laughs> insurance through him i right. think if i didn't have that that would have also made it more uncomfortable to be yeah. honest right so what happens i also find when an entrepreneur makes that leap then great things tend to happen a lot of times because then you're focusing your energy so after you go full time what changes did you see uh in the company yeah, that's when we really started to accelerate sales. We started to get into more retailers. Um, HEB was one of our big retailers. Uh, Safeway came on board um, even with, at the beginning at that at that time. So, yeah, I think um, we had a an innovative product, you know, that nobody had really seen before. So a lot of people were were interested in picking it up and you know having the time to focus on it and not have to like hide in the closet at work every time I wanted to make a phone call. Um, <laughs> like, that, Shh, uh, I'm talking to Wegmans. <laughs> right. <laughs> what client um right so yeah i think uh that that definitely having more time in the day helped to, yeah. to accelerate things for what sure. are some challenges going into stores um it's hard to find the right decision maker um first you know who is the are you talking to the stock person or the decision maker it's hard to get them to make time for you so a lot of them will say oh i don't have time leave a sample or you know, they'll call in the back and they'll pretend like the guy is oh, really, you know, really busy. Oh, he's, uh, he's busy, but you know, he just doesn't want to talk to you. And so right. you leave the samples made with the customer service person and then they never make it to the back. So it just takes a lot of persistence, I mm. think, to get to the decision maker and get in front of them and then to convince them. Yeah. What about once you're in the store? What are some things that are challenging? Yeah. It seems like getting in the store is the hardest part it until is. you're in the store. Until you're in the store and then you're like, now I have to get out of the store and some of this part. <laughs> So nobody knows who you are, right? So yeah. you know, having your yeah, you know, I think having packaging um, that speaks for itself is really important. Something that somebody's going to notice, uh, and then trying to put it in a place where people where it's a little bit jarring, right? Like why was why were pretzel crisps so successful? They were in the deli section. There's not much in the deli section. They did something very clever there. Um, so we found, for example, that anytime you put our product, it's not just like in line on the shelf. If it's on an end cap or yeah. you know on top of sale, I've bar. noticed your I've noticed some of your products in different places is almost I think in one place it was almost in a uh, like a basket like at the end of the aisle or something yeah. it wasn't on the shelf. Probably, yeah, we probably paid for that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll pay for that you know over and over again because it's that helps people notice it and nobody knows your brand so anything you can do completely to get sticks them to out. You. Completely yeah. sticks out. Yeah, so how much control over that do you have? You know, basically, you can get product placed, but it's just going to, there's a price tag involved. There's a price tag, and sometimes even if you're willing to pay the price, they don't want to give it to you because they could, you know, get um, somebody else in that space that they know is going to sell. You know, if it's Pirate's Booty, everybody knows Pirate's Booty, and, and as the store, I know I'm going to sell a thousand cases of Pirate's Booty, and I heard quinoa, I don't, you're new, and I don't know mm. how much I'm going to sell of your stuff, so why would I give you that spot? So it, that's a tough sell, too, you know? Yeah. What was the next, so grouping of product, I guess you go. So those were the clusters, right? right. And so what was the next, uh, I guess, genre of product? 
The next genre was another snack. Um, so we um, met somebody, another co-packer who could do um, extrusion. So that's you know how we make our quinoa puffs. And mm. so um, I think finding that capability enabled us to think about, okay, what could we do with if extruded quinoa? And that's how we came up with the quinoa puffs. Mm. So that we had the savory and then we added the, the sweet ones that you were talking about earlier, the pink salt and the peanut yeah. butter. Um, and that has the same base, right? So we got six products out of out of one sort of idea. There. Yeah. So what do you have in front of you? I know I asked you, will you grab some? Because I didn't have time this morning to go to the store, but I definitely have yeah. So this would be our quinoa puff. Um, it's a it's like, cheddar. Yeah, it's a cheddar. It's like a cheese puff. Um, we have a sea salt flavor. We have a cheddar, uh, chili, and we have an herb de Provence flavor. So they're like cheese puffs, um, kind of like Pirate's Booty, but made with quinoa, obviously. Um, right. And the just to have a very strong nutrition profile, high in protein, low in fat, really low in calories. So it's basically like a, you know, it's a snack that you can feel good about eating. Yeah. So what's the product development process like now? Before it was like, let's just throw a few things in the kitchen and see what we like. What's yeah. it like now? Because obviously you came up with those like, a, you know, a sea salt truffle and a cheddar. Very, you can't just experiment in your kitchen with those things. So how do no. you come up with new flavors now? Yeah, so that involved, um, so for the base, it involved going to the manufacturer and experimenting with different formulations and actually spending days on the equipment and producing thousands of pounds of product, you know, 800 pounds an hour uh, with different recipes and seeing, you know, what texture and, the, you know, what formulation gave us the best texture and, mm. and mouthfeel. Uh, and then the flavors, we basically went to Whole Foods and we bought every every flavor of, of chip and um uh, mm every salty snack that we could and we put them all on the table and we ate them all and uh, decided what was really best. Yeah, it was kind of fun. <laughs> um, so our flavors were kind of modeled after once, you know, other other brands that we liked and then we said, we like this. We went to um, um, a seasoning house basically and we said, this is, you know, we like this flavor and this genre of flavors but we want ours to be a little bit, have a little bit more hint of lime or we wanted to have, mm. you know, kind of what we're looking for and then we would work with we spent also days with the seasoning house developing the um you know what we wanted it to taste like so how and i notice what's the most popular product right now right now it's uh the cheddar puffs it is yeah okay so the clusters yeah the, the clusters you know they were the first they were our baby but um you know we kind of moved on from them so that the puffs sell a lot more and then we also now have pantry items that that are doing really well so the, the clusters are um a small part of the business now, actually. When did the chocolate come? Because you know you have chocolate covered puffs, yes. right? So when did that come into play? Yeah, those um, those came about a year after the savory puffs launched, mm -hmm. um, and so the idea there was um, we have this great puff product. Wouldn't it be delicious if if we covered it in chocolate? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Why not? So, um, but it's, it's, again, it's a very, we always kind of stick to having very simple ingredients and having a standout nutrition profile, right? So it's kind of like Brookside, right? Which are those chocolate covered acai berries, but that, yes. those have 16 grams of sugar and ours only have six. Uh, mm. Ours have, those have no protein or one gram of protein. Ours have four grams of protein. So um, what we kind of try to do is take things that we know work, uh, but put our own spin on it. Was that process much more difficult to cover in chocolate or was it not? As much no not so much yeah. it's it's called a panning process you put it it looks sort of like a big um dryer um and you just put the the puffs in there and they spin around and they get chocolate sprayed on them sounds good um <laughs> you know one thing uh about that process is what did you predict would be the most did you predict the cheddar to be the, the favorite or yeah, I think that one we knew because, I mean, if you ask any grocery buyer, by that time we were smart enough also to ask the grocery buyers what, what sells, and they all said cheddar. So cheddar is the number one, sea salt is number two, so that's why we have those flavors. Mm -hmm. um, we still try to put our own spin on it, right? We don't have just sea salt, it's sea salt truffle, so we kind of added a little bit of... Uh, that that sold me, the truffle piece, for sure. Yeah, I love truffle. What I was surprised about too, Sarah, is I didn't know until doing research for this that quinoa was a complete source of protein. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same kind of protein you would find in meat or in dairy, but it's in a seed. So it's the only uh, plant-based protein that's a complete protein like that. Like, if for rice and you'd have to eat rice and beans together to get mm. that same quality of protein. No idea about that. Um, so the other part is, you know, to get it to the shelves, 
is not easy, right? And packaging, you know, branding, everything. The other piece is, you know, you guys, I look at even the logos on the packaging are not always easy. So I'm curious, which was the hardest to get? Meaning you have, you have USDA, and this is not for all of them, but most of them, USDA organic, mm -hmm. fair trade certified, non-GMO, mm -hmm. certified cool. gluten-free, kosher, and vegan. Like each one of those in themselves is a process for you guys to actually so you can actually put it on the packaging. Yes. What was for sure. most difficult out of those? Um, I would say USDA organic is sort of the most stringent. I mean, it, it's very clear what the requirements are, but to uh, have a product that is 100% organic is very expensive and you know requires very full traceability. Um, so that's why not all of our products are certified organic, yeah. but all of our products are certified non-GMO. Um, which is also very difficult. They do a really good job of tracing all the ingredients back to all the subcomponents, mm. and there that is um, from a documentation perspective takes a really long time. Mm. Plus, everybody uh, when that certification came out, everybody was trying to get it, and so they had the non-GMO project was really backlogged. And so you'd ask, they'd ask you a follow-up question, and then three months later, right. they would look at the supporting documentation you sent in. So yeah. Those are all challenging certifications to get, but I think it's important, you know, because the consumer really needs to have People care. confidence. Yeah, and I, and I didn't know because you guys source from Bolivia. So talk a little bit about because the Bolivian quinoa is different from other regions. Yes. Oh, let let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, the Bolivian quinoa we believe it is truly superior to other quinoa sources from other areas. So it's an heirloom seed. It's never been genetically modified. Um, and so it's it has uh, really great qualities when you when you cook it. It's going to cook up to be a lot. It's a larger seed. Uh, it cooks up to be a lot fluffier than quinoa from other areas. So quinoa that's grown in Peru, for example, um, the Peruvian government did a really great job trying to increase their exports of quinoa because they do realize there's so much demand, global demand, right? But in order to increase their exports so much, they started planting uh, twice a year, and they started planting near the ocean, uh, which is not where quinoa is naturally growing. So they had to genetically modify it to make it be able to be pesticide resistant. They also spray it with a lot of pesticides by the ocean. So they don't have to do any of that um, in the Bolivian Altiplano because that's kind of where quinoa was meant to be yeah. grown cold and high altitude and the soil there um it's been you know it's been fertilized by llamas for for thousands of years right so there's a really unique profile to the soil there um, and so you get this really great seed and this great flavor from the Bolivian quinoa that you don't get anywhere else um, if you you would see it if you put the seed side by side it's clear one's you know. just much bigger than right. the, the other one Right, exactly. And what you can do when it's bigger also is toast it, so you you're not you don't burn it when it's um, small seed is really easy to mm. burn. And when you toast the quinoa, you get this really nice nutty flavor, like just like you would toast rice a lot. You know, yeah. a lot of people that it, it toasted makes it coconut. I've had the toasted coconut stuff too, um, yeah. because you so you had the clusters, then you had the puffs, and you do have toasted products too, right? Right. Yeah. So this would be our our toasted quinoa grain. So this. And maybe you can see it there, um, yeah. the seeds. Um, so this is meant to be simmered. And you, it's just a rice substitute. You use it um, like you would rice. And this is toasted, and it's Bolivian. This is our Bolivian flag. Here. Yes. Can you and then we that have right our, out of the package, though? I mean, you can put, like, if you're a diehard quinoa aficionado, yeah. you can put it on your salad and get it right out of the package. But Most people it's, cook it like rice. Right, exactly. Got it. Uh, you can put it in a stir fry. You can um, you can bake with it. We also have quinoa flakes, um, which you can tell I've been eating. The top is open, but um, I eat them for breakfast every day. So you can eat them for breakfast like oatmeal. You can use them in baking. You can make protein balls out of them. And and this also we use Bolivian flakes uh, that are toasted. Is that the like a, the hot cereal piece? Yeah. So exactly. they use people eat it like oatmeal essentially. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's super quick cooking, like a minute like and a half. That. I'll have to try that. Would the, the toasted quinoa work well? I've just experimented with um, like putting them in coconut milk and letting them soak up like, uh, yeah, like a, a rice pudding type of thing. Yeah, would, yeah. Would that work good for, for something like that? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And that toasted just gives you, just really enhances the flavor even more the toasting. Yeah. And you guys, if anyone, they have, you, you go to iHeart Quinoa. And by the way, it's spelled out phonetically. It's not 
with the Q, but it's I heart and then K E E N W A H. Um, you can check out actually a lot of the recipes on there, which uh, all look really good. Yes, uh, yeah, as well. that's, that's the the favorite part of our website. You know, you can track where people are going, and that's where people are always going. Really, with the what's your yeah. go to quinoa rep- uh, recipe at home for the family? Um, my favorite is uh, just regular toasted quinoa fluffed with a fork, and then putting um, avocado, olive oil, and um, uh, coarse sea salt on it. Mm. It's a really simple combination, but it just it's it's so delicious. Yeah. There's one person that we were talking before about you guys should talk because it would be a perfect combination. This guy interviewed, um, it's uh, Jacobson Salt, and they make it all kind of handmade, coarse salt. So you guys should talk from a a personal perspective, from a business perspective. I could see I bought their black garlic uh, salt. It would probably go really well on on your products too. I I see a collaboration in our future. Yeah. Um, So... I guess the other thing I was was curious about is um, you were talking about kind of the goals, you know, 2018, a big push. And um, talk about a little bit about what's kind of on the horizon for iHeart Humor. Yeah, I think 2018 is going to be a big year for us because um, we're finally at the table with um, some much bigger retailers. You know, at the beginning, like we talked about, we're going store to store and just selling to, you know, uh, mom and pop health food stores, but now we're sitting at the table with Kroger, with Target, with uh, Ahold, with CVS, and so um, those are our top priorities for 2018, focusing on those four retailers and making sure that we execute really successfully there because those are opportunities that, you know, they only come once and you wait a long time to get them, and so we want to make sure we really support them um, as well as we can and develop really strong strategies you know, tailor our strategies for each retailer because each retailer is different and has different, you know, tools in their toolkit. So yeah. we're really excited about that. And for a long time, it was the two of you. At what point did you decide you needed to bring on someone else? Um, when I was staying up till two o'clock in the morning, every morning processing orders, <laughs> I was like this, there's too much. So uh, yeah, I mean, you get to a point. It's a, it's a little bit of a step function, right? You can't hire somebody like when you just have too much work because you can't afford them. So you have to have way too much work on your plate, and then you can afford to You're hire somebody. Into it. Right. How, so what did you decide to hire for first? What was the the biggest thing so you were looking for? Hire an operations for? person first. Somebody to just because you're you're working so much in the business that you can't work on growing the business at a certain point, right? You're processing all the orders and ordering the ingredients and just all the logistics of the business are, you know, and all the financial aspect as well. You know, processing the invoices and collecting from people who didn't pay and making sure you're um, doing closing your books every month like that. All of that takes a lot of time, and so we hired an operations person to to take all of those sort of day to day tasks on. Yeah, especially when you have so many cool. vendors. Right. Yeah. And so, a lot of them don't pay. On time. <laughs> what um what would be next like for the company for the expansion? What would you look for next as far as bringing another skill set on? Um, so marketing uh, for sure was our second hire because you know like we talked about nobody knows who you are and so um, having somebody on board who can help develop the brand and um, you know what is what do you stand for and what you know all of the social media communications all of the, our event management being at gluten free shows and vegan festivals and um, endless amounts probably of those things amounts. which right, do you choose. Exactly. Yeah, and, and if you don't have somebody to work on that, I think you're not creating a brand, um, and that's really what we wanted to do is, is be the the brand that you know people think of when they think of quinoa. Yeah. Um, and then that's after that, I think it's sales. You know, we just we need more people going into stores and being feet on the street. There's only so many. Again, you're busy running the company of a family. There's only so many conferences and things you can go to. Which ones do you choose to spend your time at? Um, the natural products expos for sure are the most important for our brand just mm-hmm. because that you know we fit squarely in that space. Mm-hmm. So there's a natural products expo east and west, yep. um, and then after that there's fancy food shows and um, a winter one and a summer one, and then after that there's a tier of um, so those are all sort of trade shows where you can meet grocery buyers mm-hmm. and industry folks, and then there's the other set is the uh, consumer facing shows. So there we really focus on gluten free and. Uh, vegan and vegetarian because that's like our you know the most die-hard excited consumers and so yeah. we want to reach as many of them as we can 
And then what, sir, would you say has worked best for marketing and what hasn't worked of what you thought would work for getting the word out? Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's um, That's the age old question. There's definitely no silver bullet, I would say. Um, yeah. <laughs> everybody uh, says, you know, what should I do next? Um, we did a lot of demos and the demos I think are... Um, Demos at the, grocery stores, or where do you do them? Grocery stores, yeah. right? Yeah. So bringing your table and your samples, and you know, getting people to try it, and then they can buy it right there. So it's that's nice because it's really close to the point of sale. I think you need to have some money. Uh, you don't get an immediate ROI on that. I think it's a very long ROI. So if we looked at how many bags we sold at each at each product demo, we were never breaking even. So right. so you need to have some money on hand if you're going to take that strategy. Um, uh, social media has been a great way for us to kind of get the word out um, at, at a pretty low cost. You know, you need to have this either have the skill set in house or be able to hire somebody to take beautiful pictures because that really is what engages Especially people. Especially for your type of product, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. For food, it's it's just a must have. So, but that's a way to reach a lot of people and you know get to get the word out pretty effectively. Yeah. Um, um, so. Sir, this has been fantastic. I have one, two last questions, but I want to just tell people, ch go check out iHeartQuinoa.com. Yeah, like I said, spelled phonetically, K-E-E-N-W-A-H.com. Uh, Sir, I always ask because it's Inspired Insider, what has been the lowest moment in the business? And then what has been, on the flip side, what's been one of the you know proudest moments? Um, the lowest moment... Uh, I would say was we had a, a recall mm. early on in our in our development. Um, it happened at um, our small co-packer wh whom we no longer work with, and uh, it was it was pretty gross negligence on their part. But mm. they did that when the FDA was there, and uh, I thought. That's we weren't Right, exactly. I definitely thought we weren't going to make it. I thought, you know, I was I was on vacation with my family, and I spent the whole vacation, you know, in a room, like trying to sort out, you know, what was what product went where, and trace it, and talk to the FDA, and tell them how we're going to remedy it. And it was um, for sure that was the lowest point. Uh, yeah. I guess I it's a good thing when you were small and didn't have as much distribution, because it's right. it was probably a headache and horrible then. But now it would have been even worse. So yeah, for sure. And it's probably good that it happened because I think it made us realize, you know, how we need to be how it is super important to have that traceability and, and to really have confidence in your manufacturing partners. Um, but yeah, that was, it was That's, scary. I'm yeah. I get nervous even thinking about that actually. <laughs> um, so on the flip side, what's one of the, the proudest moments? On the flip side, I would say, um, you know, anytime we get into uh, a retailer, it's just this really joyous moment and something where you're just like, you you know, you're screaming out loud like, yeah, we did it. Um, yeah. That is something that, um, it's really a roller coaster of emotions. And I think that's why I like doing this is it you feel it so viscerally, right? The lows are really low and the highs are really high. And so um, getting that um, sort of affirmation and like, okay, we just got into another 200 stores. Oh, we just got into another 600 stores. Yeah. Like that feeling that's is, amazing. yeah, exactly. In parallel. Sir, congratulations. This is, you know, and, and everything you guys have accomplished. It's not easy. And uh, you continue to strive ahead and be successful. So um, everyone should check out iHeartQuinoa.com. Where else should we point people towards online? Um, you can buy, my, buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on Thrive Market, um, iHerb, um, pretty much anywhere, you know, that sells natural products. But uh, All right. Yeah. Thank you again, Sarah. I want to be the first one. Thank you so much for your time on this. Yeah, thanks for having, having me on. appreciate it. Nice to talk with you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.